All right, how's everyone doing? Good, good to see everyone. Um, what was I going to tell you guys? Oh, I was reading, uh, um, shoot, I always forget his name. Um, it's a, oh man, what's the guy's name? He's an old school dude. Uh, it's like, like there's like Tory, and then Moody. 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 I was reading Moody's book uh, this, this weekend, reading through it, and I got super pumped on it because when it talks about Moody, it was by this guy named Steve Miller, and it was talking about Moody that he didn't know how to read. <laughs> I was like, yes, I can relate to this guy. He grew up on a farm. I didn't grow up on a farm, but um, he had the world against him. Um, basically, when he was teaching, he says that he talked, he, uh, he, he spoke with his hands. I speak with my hands. Um, he was basically a spaz on stage, and uh, he didn't care about the elite speakers because they were all perfected. He just went out, and he was just passionate about Christ. And, you know, a lot of them, a lot of the elite speakers at that time didn't want to lay their hands on him because they didn't think he was ready. But obviously you could see God used this guy that was just hardcore passionate for God. Very similar to the disciples, you know. They didn't graduate from Bible college. Jesus just, fisherman, hey, come on. Come with me. Follow me, dude. I'm going I'm to show you what's up. And then God uses them to turn the world upside down. So I just got really encouraged when I read that book this, this, uh, this weekend. I was just like, yeah, God. So there is a chance. Maybe. <laughs> Send me, I'm down, let's do this, you know? So we had that going on, and then um, it's funny, this, this last week I was talking about designing a, a sock that says the end is near, because, you know, we're living in these last days, it's, it's crazy out there, and uh, it's funny, because then when I started studying for Shines this week, I happened to be in Mark chapter 13, and I'm ADD, so I don't really pay attention to the next chapter, and when I turn to it, basically the name of the study tonight is the end is near. Because Jesus is going to tell the disciples, he's talking about the last days, tribulation, and the destruction of the temple. So that's going to be the message tonight, is the end is near. Turn to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. And let me pray, because I always get anxiety before I come up here. Lord. We want to seek your face, God. That's the only reason why we're here, Lord. We just, um, we're disciples. We want to learn about you. We want to live that spirit-led life, Lord. And we want your presence, God. We don't want religion. We don't want the um, institution of the church. We don't want Christianity in a box. We don't want what the world, even the Christian industry feeds us what Christianity is, God. We want your presence. What does that look like, Lord? Take us there. I don't, I don't want what I'm force-fed, Lord. I never wanted what I was force-fed. The only thing I want is what comes from above, from the Most High God. So I pray that your spirit will baptize me now. I pray that your spirit will reach down and touch people that are here, God. Just start going through the crowd and touching people, God, and let them know that you love them. People that have come in here with baggage, things, issues, crazy life issues that they don't know where else to turn, and they're here, and this is the best place they could turn, to you. All through the Bible, Lord, it says that you will move with compassion, Jesus. You were touching the lame. You were healing the sick. You were casting demons out. You, were, you came out of eternity to love and to, to save people and to heal people, God. And that's what you're doing now because you're eternal, Lord. You were at the beginning of the earth. You were at the beginning when God created the heavens and earth, Jesus. Everything was created through you. You spoke in existence. And your Holy Spirit covered the earth just like the Holy Spirit is now covering the earth, drawing people to who you are, Jesus. So I pray that you reveal yourself, God. Do your thing here tonight, Lord. I pray that you control my tongue and let it speak the words that need to hit people's hearts where they're at, Lord. I pray that your spirit will draw people, maybe people that don't even believe in you and they're here. You're the one that draws people. I don't save anyone, Lord. No, no man can save anyone. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, God. And we know that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I pray that tonight, those ones that are here, that they'll call on you. And it's simple. It's just saying, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. And I'm coming to my life, Lord. And then you could do that supernatural work in their life where you start transforming their, mi their minds, their hearts, and making them a new person. Whatever, wherever they're at in their life, that's an old chapter, God. And today they can start that new chapter. And they, we all reap what we sow. If we, re if we reap bad things, we're, we're gonna, if we sow bad things, we're going to reap bad things. But if we start sowing the good things the spirit that life that we do, that we live through the Holy Spirit, then we will start reaping the things of the Spirit. So reap what you sow is such a beautiful thing for those that are following Christ, Lord. 
So we thank you, God, for what you're doing here, Lord. I know when I was coming here, I expect big things. Every time I walk up here, God, because I'm only here because of what you've done in my life, Lord, and you've called me to break down your word of God just in practical form, Lord, just for the simple folks, God. We're just simple folks. Just break it down for us simple, simply, Lord, so we can identify with it and we could, I, we could put, apply it to our lives, God, our lives, just like the disciples. They were just normal, common folks dealing with things of that culture, God, and you walked with them. And you had grace and mercy on their lives and you showed them and you forgave them for all the mistakes. How many mistakes did Peter make, God? Thank you for using Peter and showing us the example of this dude that just blew it. Always said stupid things and blew it. But he even denied you, Lord, and you forgave him. And you built that church up on him, Lord, on the rock, Lord. He was the little Peter. He's the little pebble. And you were the rock. But you used this guy, this common man with the issues, you use them heavily, Lord. So use us. Why can't you use us? You can, right? So I pray now, Lord, those people that are trying to find the reason why they were created, the reason why they exist, it's through faith in you. You give us that purpose. If not, we're just roaming through the earth, just aimlessly not knowing what direction to go. But once we come into communion with you, relationship, where we accept you as our Father, our Savior, then you speak to us, you show us what path to take. You open doors for us through jobs, doors with, with family, and all these different doors that you want us to walk through. And you close the ones that you don't want us to walk through. But when we don't have you, we're just walking blind, running into walls, walking into doors. We're, we're, we're on the wrong road. We take, the, we take an exit too early when we were supposed to take the next exit. It's just, we just make so many mistakes when we're not in tune with the creator of the universe, Lord. And all that you want, Father God, is to break bread with us, to have a relationship with us, Lord. It's not about religion. Religion's a waste of time. It's about a relationship with the God of the universe. So thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you for every time I make a mistake or any of us make a mistake, we just ask Jesus, God, forgive us in Jesus' name. And it's done because that's why he died on the cross. And it doesn't matter how many times we sin, you never judge us. You died for us. Thank you for that. No other religion has that. It's all by works. And we know that our human hearts are corrupt and deceitfully wicked. And the only one that knows it is you, God. And that's what a religion is. We're trying to make, hit the mark. But we know we can't. And that's why you sent your son to make it so easy. All we have to do is believe by faith in your son. Thank you, Jesus, for making it so simple. But us humans make it so hard. We think we want to do, we want to work for it and achieve it. We can't because we're sinful and we're corrupt. And I don't care how good we think we are, we are corrupt. But you love us in our corrupt state. And I love that. No other religion does that. And that's what's so amazing. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior. And thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Cool. Let me move this back a little bit. Oh, that water's about to go down. Here we go. Is there anyone new here tonight? Raise your hand. Cool. Welcome, you guys. Good to see all you guys. Right on, right on. Okay, here we go. Mark, we're going to go from Mark chapter 13, but I'm going to start at the very end of chapter 12 to paint the picture of what's going on here. So Mark chapter 12, verse 41 now, we know up to this point, the disciples and the Pharisee, they are going toe-to-toe -to -toe with J Jesus and the disciples. They're trying to trap them. They want to, they want to basically put them in jail, and they want to crucify him. They are over him. Why? It's because the people love Jesus. Because Jesus, he was a people person. He, dude, he broke bread with the people. He, he was out in the, in the, in the wilderness um, for three days with these people, just hanging out with them, healing people. He was constantly a people person. He was not disconnected. And the Pharisees and Sadducees did not like that. Because, you know, remember in the last chapter, they like to be praised in the synagogue. They, they like to sit at the head of the table. They like to walk in the synagogue. Hey, bless you, bless you, brother, bless you, you know. Hey, rabbi, you know. They like all, all that attention. And then Jesus rolls up, up on the set. And, dude, he's not only loving them, he's preaching to them. He's healing them. I mean, dude, amazing, right? Jesus is amazing, the Son of God. 
So they are not happy with Jesus. So now Jesus basically puts them into check time after ten. They can't trap them. They don't even know what to do with Jesus. I mean, what, what can you do with the Son of God? I mean, can, do you really think you can trap the Son of God? No. He created everything. Like, okay, we're going to trap him. He created us. No, these guys are just out to lunch. So now they're in the temple. And we're in chapter 12, verse 41. It says, Jesus sat down near the collection booth in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in money. Many rich people put large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped into a small coin. Now, the small coin that she dropped in, two small coins, the Bible scholars believe it was like a quarter of a cent. Verse 43, Jesus called the disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their supplies or their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything, so she uh, has given everything that she has. So basically, what's going on is Jesus is saying, you know, these people are tithing, giving to God. And when you, when you tithe, you know, when it, because I was, remember, like, what, what do you mean giving to God? What does that mean, tithing, giving money to God? Like, you give it and just up goes to heaven? Like, I don't get it, you know? No, what you're doing, this is for new Christians that are here. You're actually giving to the work of God. Like, this church, it functions because people give electricity bills, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever, staff, whatever it takes to, to make this thing operate. Or like, even like if you, when you give to the movement, say you're here and you give to the movement, we're going to high schools, we're going to 21 high schools. When you give, that funds the stage, sound and lighting, and bands, transportation, and food, and all that stuff. It funds the Lord's work. That's, that's what giving is, okay? So basically Jesus is saying, this, this lady, this poor woman, this widow, she's a widow, she doesn't have a husband. I mean, she, she's broke at this point, you know? Old woman. And basically she gives, she gives whatever money she has, and and Jesus says, these other guys that are given, that are wealthy, they're only given a little bit. Like, say, so say if you're wealthy and you, you know, you give five bucks, you know, say you're making hundred K a year and you give five bucks. You're like, okay, here you go. Well, that's not really doing anything, right? To like, that's not take, that's not any kind of sacrifice where this lady's given everything she has. And I'm not saying give everything and don't be able to pay your car bills or anything like that. I'm not saying that it's, it's a matter of the heart. It's a heart issue is basically what he's saying. And when I read this today, and I know we went through it last week, but God revealed to me, it's not about just giving your time to sacrifice. It's our relationship with God. It's all whole heart issue, right? So I thought it's also sacrifice and time. And I tried to relate it to, to me and my personal life. There's times when I'm driving and maybe, I, you know, I did my devotions in the morning or whatever. And I, you know, I like to spend a certain amount of time a week with God. Like I like to listen to Bible studies and read and just stay in tune to, to God's spirit. And, uh, you know, there's days I just want to get in my car and put on, Pandora and listen to Steve Miller and, you know, just, just listen to classic rock. I'm a classic rock guy, right? So just listen to classic rock for an hour straight, you know, driving down to San Diego or something. But then I'll think, you know what? I should actually, I haven't got to put in the time I needed with God this week. I'm going to like not do that right now. And I'm going to actually listen to a Bible study and just go deep with them. Well, now what I really want to do, and there's, I listen to classic rock, you know what I mean? But, um, there's a time that you can listen to that stuff, but then there's a time that like, you've got to spend time. And even though I want to do it, but I go, you know what? I need to spend time with God because I haven't had that time. And I'm sacrificing that time. God sees that. And I know some of you might just say, you're just going to listen to music and now you listen to Bible study. But dude, it's an issue of the heart. It's a heart issue. Like for me, I would rather listen to classic rock for an hour on my way to San Diego for that long ride than listen to Papa Chuck. Right? I mean, let's not be a religious, like, oh, man, this guy, dude, she listened to Papa Chuck. This guy's not spiritual. Dude, I go through studies like crazy. My point is, it's the sacrifice. Maybe you're, you're used to watching, you know, TV for five hours a night. I don't know. Some people do that. <laughs> There's people that do that, and a lot of them here. <laughs> dude, mark out an hour out of that five hours. And listen to a Papa Chuck CD or a Raw C D or read, read devotions. or You take time out. You sacrifice time for God. And he sees that. And guess what? He'll honor that. So just, just a little side note of, of sacrificing. It's our relationships. It's all, our whole relationship with Jesus Christ is a hard issue. It's not religion. Well, I went to Sunday service. I put my time in this, this week. I went to listen to, to Raw for, for, for uh, you know, an hour. It's not about t- clocking and climbing clocking out it's a heart issue and it's about sacrifice just like when you give 
Maybe you don't have a, maybe, maybe you're, you're saving X amount a month and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna dip a little bit out of my savings. I'm gonna give a little bit extra this month because it's not in my budget, but you know what? God's leading me to give to some certain thing. I, I don't know, wherever your heart's at, maybe you're into human trafficking. You know what, my heart, I wanna give to this human trafficking thing or maybe I see this, this guy every week on the corner by bonds and he, I know he's a bum, he needs money. You know what? I don't have it in my budget, but I'm gonna flow my little 20 spot really quick, you know? It's a heart issue. And God will honor it. So that's basically what he's saying. Chapter 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of the disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at this impressive stones and the walls. Now basically what's going on is they are in, they're basically in Jerusalem. And uh, they're, they're looking at all the cities. And when you go to Jerusalem with us, we're going to Israel in April. We're having a whosoever bus. And then we're gonna, my dad's going to take his buses for his, his, his uh, main church. But uh, when you go there, you'll, you'll walk through there and you'll see basically these, you know, this huge Jerusalem built. And Herod, he's the one that built these. He built, he built uh, Jerusalem back in um, construction in, in the uh, 19 or 20 BC. There would be 40 foot stones that you would see when we actually go by the um, Western Wall where the Jews worship. You go underneath and you see these huge stones that are actually 40 feet wide by 8 feet high that weigh 2 tons. Like, dude, Herod went nuts on Jerusalem. He built this thing gnarly. He built huge gates. He built huge bridges, huge walls. The, the temple height of the, of the actual temples itself was 18 stories high of the, of the temple. It was gnarly. Tons of gold everywhere on the fences and everything. Herod basically wanted to, for this to be his final project where when he would die, everyone would remember him for Jerusalem, what he did there. I mean, it's, it's massive. I mean, just so beautiful. So these guys are walking, and the disciples are like, they're tripping on it. They're like, dude, look at this thing. I mean, you got to understand, these guys are from the Sea of Galilee. These guys are common men. You know, like a small town folk from like North Dakota. You take them to New York, they're like, wow, man, this is crazy, right? Same thing. These guys are like, Disciples from the Sea of Galilee, Galilee, they walk into Jerusalem, huge temples. I mean, they're tripping out on everything, right? So then what does Jesus say? He replied to him, yes, look at these buildings, but they will, be, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. So now they're hanging out with Jesus, and they're like, dude, we're, we're tripping out on this. This is amazing. And now Jesus just basically says, it's like us being in L.A., walking with Jesus, and he's like, yeah, these, these things are amazing. And Jesus is like, yeah, they're all going to be demolished. And you're like, wait, what? The whole place is going to get demolished? Now, either they're going to look at Jesus and say, dude, this dude's a madman, or is he the son of God? And he's actually prophesying, telling the future of what's going to come. Well, we know in history that in 70 AD, that Jerusalem was overthrown and demolished and destroyed. So Jesus is the son of God. Just another fact that Jesus is the son of God, saying that um, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. Later, verse 3, later Jesus sat at the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple. Now I want to show you guys a photo. Some of you guys that went to Jerusalem with us, you've seen this. This is a photo where they're at. So they walk out of Jerusalem with the disciples and they go to the Mount of Olives. And now they're sitting at the Mount of Olives and they believe this is where Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is where they believe that Jesus and the disciples would sleep at night. So... This, what you're looking at, you're basically sitting at the Mount of Olives right here, and you're looking at Jerusalem, and you see the Temple Mosque, which is the gold building. To the right, in the last days, that's where they're going to build the, the, the temple, where the Antichrist is going to build the temple, right to the right of that. And in the old days, that's where the, that's where the actual original temple was. And then to the left is, to the left, that's King David's city. That's where King David would have had his, his um his uh, home set up, and the Bathsheba would have been over there somewhere. But um, so now the, the Jesus and the disciples are sitting on the Mount of Olives, just looking at Jerusalem, tripping out, and this is what they say. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew came to him privately and asked him, tell us when all this will happen. What signs will show us that these things are about to be fulfilled? So they're saying, okay, Jesus, you're saying that this whole place is going to be demolished. Like, when? How? What, like, what, what are the signs of the time? Tell me about this. So going on, um, going on, Jesus is now going to tell them basically about the coming of the Lord, the rapture. He's going to tell them about the temple being demolished, and he's going to talk about the tribulation, the last days. And he's doing the shorter version. If you guys read Luke or Matthew, they have the longer version. But we know that Mark had ADD. He was like a little kid, and he only gives like little bits of each of the gospel. He doesn't break it all down, you know, he's probably in a rush. So he gives us 
a small bit of what they give us in Matthew and Luke. So it goes on to say, and Luke was a doctor, so he was like super detailed. Mark, you guys remember? He was the naked kid at 12 years old running out of the garden. Remember that? He was that guy. They went to grab him. He's just like broke out. He's like, I ain't going down with you guys. He was just a kid hanging out with Jesus. Think about it. He was 12 years old when Jesus and disciples were going around shaking up the place. He was just this little kid just like tripping out on everything, you know? I mean, think about that. I mean, that would have been radical to be 12 years old just hanging out with Jesus. I mean, just seeing all the miracles going down. Amazing. So verse 5 says, Jesus replied, don't let anyone, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. So he's saying that people are going to come in my name, I'm Jesus Christ's name, and saying that they're the Messiah. Have you guys, do you guys know that there's actually Jesus Christ people out there right now that say that he, they're the Messiah? Have you ever Googled that? So I was at home the other day, and I read this, and I'm like, I remember seeing some guy in Miami a while ago, and he calls himself Jesus Christ the Messiah. He was from Puerto Rico, and then it was on the news, and now he's in Miami, and he says, I, in the interview, he says, I'm Jesus Christ, the second coming. They go, can you do miracles? He goes, no, because I'm Jesus Christ, the second coming. And he's having his whole church get tattooed 666. Dude, he shows him. Who saw it? You saw it, right? They're getting drilled 666. I put it on my Facebook. Go to Ryan Reese, uh, my Facebook, and I put three of the links. So I Googled. I'm like, I wonder if there's any more fake Jesus Christ going on in this earth. I Googled on YouTube. Two other guys popped up. I just did a little short search. I'm sure there's a lot more. There's one guy in Eastern Europe that wears like a white robe and he has like the hair and he's walking around. Vice Magazine did an article on him, total fraud. Then there was another guy in, uh, in Australia and he actually lives at Mary Magdalene. Who knows? So there's these false messiahs, but this is what's crazy. Dude, people follow them. Dude, they have like full churches. They have thousands of people living with them and going to these churches. Just crazy hypocrisy. And now Jesus is actually predicting this before he even died. So he's actually prophesying that these are going to be the signs before the rapture comes. So going on, it says, And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go, against, uh, nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Have you guys seen the news lately? Is it get, okay, who's older? I always go to Irma because she's from Irma. Irma, you've been around a while. Let's say you've been around a while. Fair to say. Uh, she's like, don't go there. Is the news getting any better? It, it's getting worse, right? I mean, there was World War I. And World, I'm not saying you're around, you know, just. There was those wars and Vietnam and all these wars. And, um, but dude, it's getting crazier. Just from my life, it's, the, the wars are getting crazier. And what's even crazy is the Bible prophesies and talks about that Russia is going to come against Israel, right? And Ezekiel and, these, and, and the other uh, Isaiah, I think. And uh, it talks about Turkey and the Middle East, the Arab countries are going to come against Israel. Have you guys seen the news? Putin, he's like, yo, send one of our boys over America, airwave. <laughs> Flies over, flexes on America. What does Obama do? Uh, I'm cool. I'm not going to do nothing because I haven't done anything my whole term. So why would I do anything now? I'm cool. Dude, P Putin's fl flexing on us, right? Russia. Russia is coming down. It says in the Bible that Mo, uh, Mega, I think it's Gog. Is it Gog? Mo, Mogog or Gog. One of those. I forget what it is. But it, it's what is now Russia. They're going to come down towards Israel. And what are they, what, what's Russia saying right now? Israel, do something. What are you going to do? Do something. Dude, time is coming. What Jesus is saying right now, he's talking about these times. These things are going to happen, and this stuff's going to happen before the rapture comes. That's when Jesus comes for his church. So it's going down. It's, it's plain as day. So he goes on to say, you'll hear of wars and blah, 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 blah. Um, going on, it says, um, nation will go against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines, but this is only first of the birth pains with more to come. Okay, let's talk about earthquakes and famines. Okay, we know Africa is full of famines. Um, we know that there's earthquakes. I mean, has there been tsunamis? Has tsunamis been happening in the last 30 years? No. I mean, we got tsunamis in, in, in Thailand, tsunamis in uh, Japan, the big earthquake. South America's been getting earthquakes. We've been getting earthquakes. There's famines. I mean, and they're increasing. And people are getting scared. So these are, these are also, also things that are going to be happening 
be happening before Jesus Christ comes back. Verse 9, when these things begin to happen, Jesus says, watch out. You will be handed over to the local council and beaten in the synagogue. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So we're, we live in America. Is this happening right now? Are people getting beaten because you're, G- you're, you're followers of Jesus? It's not happening here in America yet. But I'll tell you where it's happening. We had, we had Saeed's wife here. Remember that? Now, Jesus is in the Middle East when he's talking to saying these things. He's talking to the world. This is happening all over the world, different parts of the world. Saeed got arrested. He's been arrested. He's been in jail for eight years. You remember the story. His wife told it. They're beating him. He's sick. They're not taking care of him. He's doing what Jesus said. He's sharing the gospel. People are getting saved in those jails. And then they're like, get this guy out of here. Everyone's following Jesus. Boom. Send him to the next jail. Everyone finds Jesus. Get him out of here. So he's just spreading the gospel. His wife gets to speak in front of the UN and gets to give the whole UN, the council, the gospel of Jesus Christ through this persecution, just like what Jesus said. So he's reaching so many people. He's doing exactly what what Jesus told him to do. Going on, it says, for the good news, which in my Bible says the good news, but it's the gospel, uh, must first be preached to all the nation. And some of you guys here, let's, let's think about this. When Jesus was saying this back in the day, Way back in, when, in these days, or let's just say even the 50s and the 40s, there was no inner anything. You're probably going, how in the heck is the gospel going to get out to all the nations? Dude, we got satellites. We got internet. We got missionaries going out all over. And some of you here might be saying, well, what about that Indian in the Amazon that, you know, doesn't know anything about Jesus? What about him? Well, I know that what, what Jesus is doing in the Arabic countries where there's no Christians or no gospel, that Jesus is showing up to him in dreams and visions. I mean, is it too much for Jesus to show up to some little Indian guy running around in the Amazon? You know? You know how those guys are down there. They're crazy, you know? Jesus would show up to them and tell them, I'm the son of God, just like he's telling the, the, the Muslims. And, dude, tons of them are getting saved down there. It's awesome. And I heard Chuck Smith say something about, he's all, hey, if you're so concerned, like there'll be like one guy that's not a Christian. Hey, Chuck, you know, I don't believe in the whole gospel because what about those poor guys that are in the middle of nowhere and no one ever tells them about Jesus? And Chuck Smith's like, well, if you're so concerned about them, why don't you go tell them about Jesus? You know, well, you don't want to follow Jesus? Well, you become a Christian. You go to the ends of the earth and go tell these guys. If you, if you got this, this big problem with them not knowing about Jesus. I was dying when I heard that. Verse 11. But when you are arrested and stand trial, that guy that says that's just an excuse not to believe in Jesus. He's just making an excuse. Well, I don't believe in Jesus because the Bible's not true. You know, not everyone's going to hear about Jesus. He's just fighting it. Anyway, verse 11. Maybe you're here and you're fighting it. Don't fight it, dude. Jesus loves you. And he has a plan for you. Verse 11. But when you are arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what you're going to say. Just say what God tells you at the time. For it is not you who will be speaking but the Holy Spirit. And we remember that story in Acts of, of um, what's his name, of, si- of uh, Stephen, when he was about to get beaten. Remember Paul was hanging out there when he was holding everyone's robes? It says that his face shone like an angel. It just glory of God came upon him, and he gave one of the gnarliest sermons. And was he, he was, he was season in season and out of season. I and mean, he, was, he was just following God in, in, in the word, but he didn't prepare no sermon. He just showed up, got put on the spot. You know, he said a prayer. He's just like, God baptized you. Boom, the Holy Spirit comes upon him, shone like an angel and gave this gnarly sermon. So wherever you're at, whenever you go out and speak anywhere, if you have an opportunity to share your faith, someone asks you about Jesus, dude, don't even trip. It's just step out by faith. Say that prayer in your mind. Jesus, baptize me and speak. And when you speak, I guarantee when you're done telling your story, or speaking for God, you're going to walk away, scratching your head and going, what the heck just happened? How did all that just come out? Who has that happened to? Raise your hand. Huh? Isn't that crazy? You literally walk away and you're like, I didn't even know I knew that much of the Bible. <laughs> Where did that verse come from? Because the Holy Spirit draws. When you read the Bible, some of you guys, like me, you'll read, you'll read like a bunch of chapters and then you'll be like, what did I even read? I don't remember. And then you're like talking to someone and all of a sudden, boom, that verse comes out and you're like, oh my gosh, I re- what, what the heck? Because... The Spirit draws from what we put in. That's why it's important to read through the Bible. And when you're sharing your faith or having a conversation, the Spirit will just bring a verse. 
You may not remember exactly. Like, I don't remember a lot where things are. I've done too many drugs in my life. I can't just be like, Matthew 5, 3, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm not like Sean McKeon. I don't know what happened with that guy. You know? He used to be like, duh, yeah, drooling. Now he's like, John 5, 3, I bust another porn spear. Blah, blah, blah. Matthew 4, 3, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, who are you? Who are you? How do you even do that? I, I, could, I could quote scripture, but I don't know where it's at. I don't, I don't got the numbers. That guy's crazy, man. That guy's out there, you know? But those verses will come back. If you read them, you might not be able to quote where they're at, but they'll come back, they'll come back you know? We'll go back. So anyway, verse 12. A brother will betray his brother to death, and a father will betray, betray his own children, and a child will rebel against his parents and cause, him to ki- and cause him to be killed. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And I underline that. Everyone's going to hate you because you're my followers. But if you endure to the end, you'll be saved. And when I read this, it reminded me of... Uh, in. 2 Timothy 3, 1, 5. I'll read it for you really quick. It talks, Paul is talking about the dangers of the last days, what, what it's going to look like in the last days. So he writes, you should know this, Timothy. He's right, Paul's writing to this, his younger pastor, Timothy. He's just, he's just loving on him, just telling him, like, check this out, Timothy. In the last days, there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from from people like this. And when I read this, I thought of like so many hip hop artists. <laughs> I'm like, Kanye, Jesus. Man, you know, just these guys are little Wayne, like these guys are all promoting all this garbage, but they're like, I like to thank God. I like to thank God for what he's done in my life. You know, just just puffed up with pride. And I'm not coming against the rap community. I'm just, you know, if, if you just watch the whole hip hop culture, just everyone's just like, you know, you know, very prideful, money you know, acting religious, being very far from God, you know. It's just wearing, wearing, the, wearing the cross, don't even know what it's about. So that's the last taste. That's what Paul's talking about. So yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely happening now, right, when you read that? Exactly what's going on now. Verse 14, the day is coming when you will see the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing where he should not be. Now, what Jesus is talking about, he's talking about after the rapture, and there's, there's so much to the prophecy, but I'm going to just break it down like this. He's talking about the rapture comes, takes the church. We know that the Antichrist is going to rise up. Picture the rapture comes, there's thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of people gone worldwide. People are going to be going crazy, just going like, what the heck just happened? We don't know if our spirits are going to be gone and our bodies are going to be left here. We don't know if our whole bodies are going to be taken up. We don't know, but whatever happens, say if God takes our whole body, or whatever happens, people are going to be going, car, all these cars are going to be crashing, planes are going to be falling out of the air. People are going to be going, dude, what the heck are happening? People are going to be tripping out. The government's going to have to say something. What's going to happen is, you know, who knows what the government's going to say. They're not going to say Jesus came back. They're going to probably say, the aliens come. They came. The aliens are gone. But thank God that Apple just came up with this brand new chip. And you could put it in yourselves, and everyone's, all the hipsters are like, Apple, for show, put it in, put it in. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the business. Apple, people don't care about Apple. Anything Apple, they'll just buy it. It says Apple on it, right? We got a chip. Put the chip in. We want to make sure that no one disappears. We can track you guys. There'll be no more crime. It'll be safe because the world's going to be in, in an uproar. People are going to be scared, terrified. People want security. If you don't have Christ, you're terrified. You're looking at the news, you're like, what in the heck is going to happen? So the government's like, look, we're going to have a one world order. Don't trip. We're going to get everyone chipped. Apple's going to take care of us. One bank system. All the money will be equal. The aliens won't be able to get to us. We got it. I'm just saying aliens. Don't quote me. Ryan Reese believes in aliens. They're going to probably say it's aliens. I don't know. That's my just hunch, but I don't know. So the Antichrist is going to rise up. The scripture says he's going to come out of the east. He's going to come out of the, you know, the, the union, the, the, the Euro union. He's going to rise up probably out of Italy. The false prophet's going to rise up too. And he's, they're going to make world peace, one religion, world peace. 
you know, everyone come together, peace, one world nation, one, one order. And he's going to actually go to the Jews and he's going to say, hey, I'm going to build your temple for you guys. And if you go to Israel today, when you go with us, and this is crazy, part of the tour, we do the Temple Institute. We go to the Western Wall where the Jews worship, where the temple used to be, right on the other side of the Temple Mount where the Arabs hold now. They can't go there. When you go there, the, the Orthodox Jews, they right now have built all the pieces for the new temple. The ephod, the, the uh, I can't even think of the names of them. What else? The, the gold, the trumpets, the, the utensils for the temple. Everything that they will use in the temple, the menorahs, the giant, huge giant menorah, like King Solomon's days, huge giant menorahs. They built it all. And you go, cool. So are you guys planning to build a temple? And they're like, yeah. We're waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah will be here any day. And when we know the Messiah, we'll know who the Messiah is because he's going to build our temple. And you will cringe because Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They are ready, open arms for the Antichrist. So when the Antichrist is going to roll up on the set and just be like, hey, world peace. Hey, I'm going to make peace between the Arabs and the Jews. So we're all good. There's no more fights. We're going to put a wall in between like the scriptures say. We're going to build you guys your temple. They're going to be like, Awesome. Jesus, the Messiah has showed up. They're going to start offering sacrifice. They're going to be burning at sacrifice to God for three and a half years. There will be peace. And then the Antichrist is going to walk into the temple and he's going to say, stop the sacrifice. I'm God. Worship me. And dude, they're, blind, the, the, what's, they're blinded right now. The Jews are blinded. God's people. Right when that happens, the blinding is going to come off their eyes. They're going to reveal, oh my gosh, Jesus Christ was the Messiah. We were wrong, and now this is what's going to... Oh, and then before we go on, then the last three years, that's when it's going to get gnarly. Three and a half years, dude, people are going to be running for the hills. The Antichrist is going to reign. You're going to have to have the mark of the beast. You're going to have to worship him, or you're going to have to get your head cut off. So if you're a Christian in those days when the Holy Spirit's not going to be here, the Holy Spirit's going to be gone. If you think you're having a hard time walking with God with the Holy Spirit that's constantly drawing you to Jesus... When the Holy Spirit's God, try living for God then. Maybe you're like, oh, I'll, just, I'll just give my life to the Lord in the rapture. I'm going to enjoy life. Try living for God without the Holy Spirit. It's hard now with the Holy Spirit. We're constantly warring with our flesh. No Holy Spirit trying to walk with God. Gnarly. And then on top of it, you have the one world government and people are going to come against you because they want peace. And you have to have that mark of the beast, which is that chip that you're going to buy, you're gonna be able to buy and sell with that only. And if you don't do that, you don't bow down to the Antichrist. Boom, off with your head. And if you get away, so now you're that guy. You're like, yo, dude, I got camping skills. I went to Boy Scouts. I'm just going to, I got guns. You know, maybe you've seen Red Dawn. And you're like, Red Dawn, or what are they called? Wolverines, right? You know what I'm talking about? And I'm talking about the old Red Dawn. And you're like, I'm going up to the hills. We're going to live off the land like Red Dawn. They're going to come. Me and my friends are going to smoke these fools when they come after us, right? Maybe you're thinking about that. I got news for you. It says in the last days, I think it's in Jude or something, I just read it. In the last days, they're going to, and, and it's in Revelation 2, they're going to unlock the, they're going to unlock the key to this, the pit where these angels from Enoch days that didn't stay within their ground or in their realm and they left, they were having sex with the women and they were birthing half humans and half demons, the Nephilim, you can read about it. And that's why God said, dude, the world is corrupt. I'm sending a flood and destroying the Nephilims and all the wicked perversion and everything. Well, those demons that left their realm, they were so evil that they put them in the pit that are held for judgment. And these demons, when they come out, they look, they have like long hair, face like lion, tails like scorpions and wings like eagles. And they're going to be let out and they're going to torture people for this time. So maybe you're playing Red Dawn and all that business. They're coming for you. And you can't kill him. You know why you can't kill him? Because God withdraws death from the world. You can't flee death. So even if you try killing yourself at this time, you can't die. So these demons are going to come and torture you. It's going to be crazy, crazy times. There's this movie, before we go on, there's this movie called The Remaining. And it's from Sony Picture. And you know most Christian movies are cheesy and corny? This, well, I don't care, I said it. I like the Bible movie. It's, <laughs> Bible movies off the chains. I love that movie. But most movies, I'm like, ah, I can't do it, can't do it. You know, Hollywood's my standard, right? So, remaining, you know, those are good movies. Like, you know, they're not corny. You're like, what is this? This isn't even real. The remaining, this movie, it's about the rapture. 
when the rapture comes and when the demons and all that are let out. It, dude, it's crazy. I'm going to actually do a premiere for it here very soon. I'll let you guys know, but it's legit. It's a Christian movie and it's, it's, it's real, but it shows about all those crazy, all the crazy things that are going to happen after the rapture comes. And it has, a, it has a cool message. So you can bring your unsaved friends. They'll be like, what the heck? <laughs> Jesus, please. <laughs> yeah. Where do I sign up? <laughs> So if you are hiding from them, you're going to have to live past those demons. And then if you make it through all that, then you can get to heaven. But why take the hard way? All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ in your life and live for him now and have purpose in your life. You know, not waste time and have to deal with those demons, man. I don't want to deal with it. Read about them. It's crazy. So going on, it says, reader, pay attention. Those in Judea must flee to the hills. So he's saying those people that are here, and he's actually talking about those Jews. He's saying when that happens, the Jews, they're, they're going to be unblindfolded, and they're going to have to just run to the hills. And they believe that the Jews are going to run to Petra, where that, that city, and God, they're going to go in there, and God's going to protect the Jews, the nation of Israel, those remaining Jews. And he's going to protect them there from, um, from the Antichrist and those demons. Uh, verse 15, a person out on the deck rooftop must not go down to the house and pack. A person out on the field must not return even to the coat, even to get his coat. How terrible it would be for the pregnant woman and for the nursing mothers of those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter, for there will be, there will be great anguish in those days then and, and at any time since God created the world, and it will never be so great again. It's going to be horrific, terrible. You don't even want to be there. It's going to and you've, we've heard of the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah and all those things. It's going to be a million times worse than that. Verse 20, in fact, unless the, door, unless the Lord shortens the time of calamity, not a single person will survive. But for the sake of his chosen ones, he will shorten those days. Because of his covenant with God's people, the Jews, he's going to shorten those days. If not, no one else, no one would even survive. It's just going to be hell on earth. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah or there, there he is, don't believe him. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform signs and miracles so that he can deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. Watch out. I have warned you about these ahead of time. So the pro false prophet and the, and, and the Antichrist, they're going to be doing signs, calling fire down from heaven. They're going to be doing crazy things. So people will go, oh, this is God, to deceive God's people. Verse 24, at that time, after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in heaven will be shaken. Imagine, at the end of all that, stars are going to be falling, just like asteroids, the sun's going to be dark, the moon's going to be blood red. Dude, I, I was sitting out on, on my porch today, reading this, like, looking, like, kind of tripping out, trying to imagine what was going to happen. Imagine after all that chaos, you see the, the stars falling, I mean, just the craziest stuff that you see in movies. People will be going, dude, what in the heck is going on? This world, this earth, this universe, everything is going to be shaken. Jesus is going to be like, just, man, just shaking, just causing everything to happen. Then, and it talks a little bit more about it in Isaiah 16, Joel, Amos. It talks about the, the tribulations times. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming. Everyone's going to see Jesus coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send out his angels to gather his chosen ones, from, from all over the earth, from the farthest, farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that the summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that his return is very near, right at the door. When you see all this stuff happening, you guys, Jesus Christ is coming. It's near. I tell you the truth. And when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you better listen, right? You know, when we, when we tell people, hey, I'm telling you the truth. Let's just listen to this. You're very serious. Jesus is saying, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. And when I read this, I thought about in John, in John 1, why won't his words disappear? Because in John 1, when we read it, it says, John 1, chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the word already existed. The word was with God. The word was God. 
He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will never extinguish it. Why won't it ever disappear? Because the word is Jesus Christ. He was with God in the beginning. He spoke everything into existence. When the world and everything disappear, who will remain? Jesus. Why? Because he created everything. Jesus is the, he's in the beginning and in the end and in the present. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He's eternal. So he will still, when everything is gone, Jesus is going to still be hanging out. Like what's next, right? Going on. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only Father knows. And since you don't know uh, when the time is going to come, be on guard and stay alert. And we've seen time after time, time over the years people go, Jesus is coming in 1981. And then everyone waits, and then no show. No one knows the time or the hour. That's what the Bible says. So why in the heck are these clowns saying, I know the hour, if not even the Son, Jesus Christ, knows only the Father. Do they think they're more special than Jesus? They obviously do, because they're making these claims. Jesus is coming back in 1990. Get your robes on and hang tight. You know, they do all those, those crazy cult things. Bunch of weirdos. Verse 34. Stay alert, though. If I could leave you with this. Stay alert. Signs of the times. Things are happening. Jesus Christ is coming. The coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated as the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work that they were to do. And he told the gatekeeper to watch out for his return. You too must keep watch. For you don't know when the master of the household will return. In the evening, at midnight, before dawn, at daybreak, don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone. Watch for him. Watch out. And when I read this last part, it says, don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives. Sleeping is basically sleeping, not spiritually, not in tune to the spirit life, being dead to the spirit. You got to be alive in the spirit, awake, living the spirit life. And if you're living that spirit life and Jesus Christ put his Holy Spirit inside you, when that trumpet rings, all you have to do is put your hands out. Boom. Gone. To heaven. If not, you're stuck here. And then you got to go through the end times. And dude, God sent his son that no one will perish, but everyone will come to repentance and have everlasting life. That's why he sent his son. So wrapping it up, if you're here, and you want to give your life to Jesus, I just want you to stick your thumb up, and I want to say a simple prayer with you before I walk off the stage. Just throw it up, and I'm going to pray for you. Right on. Anyone else? Cool. I see you in the back. I see you in the very back. I see you back there. See you back there. Cool. Anyone else before we close? Maybe you're here, and your heart's tugging, and you're like, Dude, this, whole, this, this guy's making some sense. I need to give my life to God. I'm scared. I don't know if this is real. Maybe you're just battling with that whole thing, that doubt. The enemy loves to put doubt into people's minds. He's the father of lies. He's the destroyer. He wants you to believe that none of this is real, to go on to live your life, and then it, when you don't live for God, at the end, basically, if you aren't following God, you have, there's two places, there's two destinations. There's heaven and hell. And his goal is to get as many souls to hell as possible because he got kicked out of heaven. He got kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be the most high God. And God said, dude, you're out of here. Boom. And he sent him to earth. So now he's on a mission on this earth to destroy and bring people to hell. But God has come to give life. Satan has come to destroy. 